We continue to collect uh, clothes for uh, school uniforms over at Hannah Penn School. A collection box is located downstairs in the lower narthex. And we do take funds as well. Uh, if you don't have time or it doesn't work out for you uh, to go ahead and uh, purchase clothes for that purpose, we we will do that for two more Sundays, and, and that's all the time that we have. We also have the community meal being held this morning. That means that the George Street entrance exit will be closed off because uh, that's where the food uh, distribution will uh, take place. So either uh, go out to the courtyard and leave by King Street or uh, over on Mason Avenue uh, to the other side, which I believe is there in that direction, the King Street is direction. Welcome this morning to our ninth Sunday at Pentecost. We take a few moments now to prepare ourselves for worship. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Most merciful God, we confess that we are admonished to sin and cannot defend ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So let us be the light of your world and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As we call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
grace and peace to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As I sometimes do, I am starting out the message with a book in my hand. This one is entitled, Please Understand Me, Character and Temperament Types. I came across it 20 years ago. Some of you might be familiar with it, or at least uh, the subject it covers. It accounts for someone's personality by identifying several characteristics and how they fit together uh, to, uh, to bring in uh, the makeup or bring about the makeup of that person. There are four basic ones. First is the individual outgoing or introverted. Second is she or he intuitive. That is someone who understands others or can see the big picture. Or might that person gravitate toward hands-on activities that require both natural and developed skills? Third, does someone spend a lot of time in the head or in the heart, in, the, <clears throat> in thinking or in feeling? Last is a person process oriented. Does he or she prefer to keep things open ended? Or instead have a definite need to get them done, to wrap things up? Whatever combinations of these categories uh, describes a person best is what is known as his or her temperament type. If not mistaken, I, I believe it's sometimes used to help young people explore occupations they may be especially suited for. Maybe something done alongside you know, an, an aptitude test. And I think sometimes in premarital counseling, uh, couples will undergo uh, testing uh, to find out these things about themselves. Reading this book was, for me, a great re uh, revelation. It helped explain a lot of things about others and myself. You know, introverted, just the way God made me. Intuitive, well, okay. Maybe that's why in shop class I was fine at the drafting table, but out on the floor with the tools in my hands? Yeah, not a pretty sight. Overthinking things, yes, and sometimes unaware of my emotions, yes. The get the job done philosophy, or let's wait a while longer approach. BC, before children, I used to be more of the first. Get her done. Decades later, not so much. Kids uh, have a way of changing people. In passing, I have to say this book is not necessarily the Bible for explaining why and who we are as individuals. In that regard, it's not the be all end all. For who we are is determined not only by nature, but also by nurture. The homes we grow up in. You know, our relationships with our, our parents and what we have learned from them for good and bad. And of having siblings, the same with them, you know. They also make a great difference. It's not only genetics, it's not only biology. However, if having first known about this book 40 years ago instead of 20, I might have saved myself some precious time. I might have connected some of the dots a lot earlier and been the better for it. Well, in reading some commentaries about today's gospel, on a very small scale, I had a somewhat similar experience. And what I mean is this. There are details in the reading 
that are rather obvious, but still, I never noticed them before, or, or enough to connect the dots. In other words, there are a number of parallels between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of God's people in the wilderness. So there are Jesus, the disciples, and that great crowd. What happens first is he and his inner circle go up a mountain. Moses climbed up Mount Sinai you know, to get the Ten Commandments. Second, we read in verse 4 that it's near the time of the festival of Passover. As we know, the original Passover meal took place in Egypt, the night before the Israelites were freed from the bondage that they were living in and led by Moses across the Red Sea. Third, as God gave to the people in the wilderness manna to, to eat, that fine flaky substance, you know, covering the ground every morning, which they then made into small cakes. So God provides plentiful bread and fish to the crowd out in the middle of nowhere. Last, as the Israelites knew Moses to be a great prophet, so the Jews among Jesus also recognized that in him. They began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Why did I never see those similarities before? Why did I never connect those dots? Have, have I ever thought of Moses and Jesus as great prophets? Yes, of course, but, but not from this passage. At the same time, there are some differences between these two prophets. And as I was going over this sermon again, I, I realized, you know, one other thing uh, that I haven't noticed is that I have a total of three different lists. And so I hope you bear with me. I, I, I recall my dissertation professor when, uh, when he read one of the chapters, telling me he had a had a notation on his side in the margin and said he said this is quite listish and I never had seen that word before but that be that as it may here we go first after the Israelites had grown tired of eating only manna and began complaining and Moses cried out to God where am I to get meat to give to all this people for they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. But in today's gospel, Jesus doesn't turn to God and do the same. Rather, he asks a disciple where they can get food for the people. A rhetorical question because Jesus already has it figured out. Second, Moses told the people not to collect more of the manna than they needed for one day, except enough for the day following whenever it was the Sabbath. In contrast, in the Gospel, after the crowd has eaten their fill, Jesus orders the disciples to collect the extra food, of which there is still a good amount. Last, the most important difference is this. Jesus realizes that the crowd is about to come and take him by force to make him king. So to keep that from happening, he goes back up the mountain. Moses was not only a religious leader, but he was also a political one. He actually confronted a king, you know, Pharaoh, and eventually led his people to freedom. But on the other hand, if Jesus is a king at all, He's a very different kind of one. Before his crucifixion, before he's handed over to the people by the Roman governor, by Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not from this world. As is said in some of the commentaries I read last week, 
Today's gospel has to do a lot less with what Jesus does, that is multiplying uh, the bread and fish, and a lot more to do with who he is. It has more to do with his identity and how he invites us into a spiritual relationship with him and the Father and the Spirit and with one another. As it so happens, this is the year in our three-year cycle of readings that goes through virtually all of the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. And it all has to do with Jesus being the bread of life. So that's what we'll be looking at for the next four weeks. And while many ministers dread preaching this long on this one particular theme, and I have to say that I have been among them, this time I'm actually looking forward to it. And I bet a number of you um, are as well. You may already be saying to yourselves, Hallelujah, pastor is finally going to get off his soapbox of preaching about one social issue after another. It's about time. It's going to be so refreshing to hear for a change about something spiritual. Okay, well, spiritual doesn't only mean otherworldly or something uh, for us in our individual lives. For Jesus being the bread of life also means his coming into and living in this world. You know, as, as it said in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. So for the next four Sundays, we're going to connect the dots. We're going to move from Jesus feeding the 5,000 to him being the bread of life, to us eating his flesh and drinking his blood. If that language doesn't sound earthly, worldly in a sense, you know, then I, I don't know what does. An important thing to remember is that who we are isn't divided up into various categories. We are not simply, each of us, some grouping of character traits that have been somehow stuck together, like being introverted or extroverted, being intuitive or more in touch with physical things, being thinkers or feelers, or being a get or done type, or someone who prefers to let things play out. Each and every one of us is a complete person, sometimes complicated, but complete. We are spiritual, we are physical, we are emotional, you know, all wrapped up into one. And besides that, we are all interconnected with one another and with all human beings. You know, even ones um, we don't understand and sometimes don't like. Also, of course, we are connected to the rest of creation. And we are called, and, and using an example of, of something from uh, the rest of creation, as Jesus said, we are called to become the branches growing out from the true vine, whose own life comes from the one who creates and sustains all that is good. These are the things we're going to look at for the next four weeks. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
with me in confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his grave. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
to the Lord our God. It is indeed mine and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to your Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us forever everlasting life and us over the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending